is the worst case. Military planners don't say, oh yeah, it's going to work out, don't worry about it. Military planners, worst case, everything. What happens in the worst case if it goes wrong? And then they build what we call branches and sequels. How do I recover from it? So this is worst case thinking. What happens if in those green X areas where lots of Armenians live and the committees are active and we know they're heavily armed, what happens if they do the same thing that happened to them? What's going to happen? Well, it's been a 300-year dream of the Russian czars since Peter the Great to get a port on the Mediterranean Sea. And if this happens, the Russians will be there in a very short time. That's the thinking in Constantinople. How would they have dealt with this before? They would have sent in the army. Resources determine policy. How we dealt with counterinsurgency, how we dealt with insurgency, and a counterinsurgency response up until this point is to send in the army. Here's the strategic dilemma. The army's gone. The army's on the frontiers. The army's fighting the Russians and the British and the French and the Australians now, um, all over the place. So, no combat forces in this area. No combat forces. What to do? This is a huge problem. This is the framework for what's, what I'm about to unroll as a thesis here. Uh, it doesn't matter if the Armenians were in rebellion or not. It's not germane. It's not relevant. What matters is what the Ottoman decision makers, and we're talking about three people, Enver, Talat, and Jamal, believed what was happening. Something doesn't have to be true to have an effect. George Bush in 2003 thinks yellow cake or uranium is being smuggled into Iraq with, with rods uh, sufficient to make nuclear weapons and that Saddam Hussein is making nuclear weapons. We know today not true. <laughs> um, if you want to explain George Bush's decision, then you would have to talk about that. What he believed, he thought he knew. If you want to judge George Bush, that's something else. So what I'm doing here is explaining a decision process. I'm not judging the Young Turks. I think they got it wrong. I'm not going to validate or, or justify the decision. What I'm explaining is how did they reach the decision they reached? They reached it because they believed everything that I've presented to you so far. It doesn't matter if, if Jennifer thinks I'm having a, an affair with the blonde pole dancer next door. It doesn't matter if it's true. I, I've got a problem. So, Um, all right, Th this is the problem set. Problem definition. Here is the problem. Talat is the Minister of the Interior. The Ministry of War has already started partial relocations in selected areas behind the front. The Minister of the Interior, as a matter of, of government policy, gets involved in, because these are out of the citizens. Here's what's kind of, kind of different about, about this whole thing. These are not not insurgents in Syria who come in from, from foreign countries. These are actual Ottoman citizens uh, who, who pay taxes and who are an important part of the economy. They, 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 are, they, are, they are essential for the running of the railroads. They're essential for the conduct of business and all the things that are happening in the Ottoman Empire. So here's Talat's definition, the Minister of the Interior's definition of the problem. Some Armenians, there's no all the Armenians, there's no most of the Armenians. There's no majority of them. Some of the Armenians living in places close to the battlefield have become involved in activities like obstructing the operation of the army, cutting supplies, interdicting munitions, collaborating with the enemy. Some of them have joined the enemy's ranks. They're inside our own country carrying out armed attacks against military forces and innocent civilians. This is, this is, we call this today, problem framing, don't we? This is the problem, as he sees it. What's the solution? The traditional, time-tested solution, a kinetic approach to kill everybody, 
with the army can't be done because the army's gone. It's fighting the British, the French, and the Russians. Here is the famous relocation order. This is the solution to the problem. We're going to separate the insurgents, the guerrillas, the word they use is chete, which can be, can be translated as bandit, insurgent, guerrilla, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flexible term. But these rebel elements have rendered it necessary to do something different. And that thing is, is, that's different is, is to separate the guerrilla, the insurgent, from his base and his source of supply. What happens then? If I can isolate them from their source of supply where they get food, where they get rest, where they get sanctuary, where they get resupplied with munitions, then they will wither away. And the few soldiers I have and I can bring in can take care of them because they're too weak to oppose us. So this is the strategic approach at the highest policy level. We're going to separate guerrillas and insurgents from their base of support. Everybody, not everybody, not every Armenian, only some of the Armenians, and here are the places that this directive affects. It's explicit. The eastern Anatolian provinces that overlay those X's I showed you. If you look at this on a map, this is, these are the spatial characteristics of the Sultan's decree. This is the area that's affected. So, they start relocating, deporting people. What's the difference? Why do I use relocation? De deportation means you're never coming back. Relocation means that you're coming back. They set this thing up. This is not the army that does it. This is the Ministry of the Interior. And there are supposed protections that are put into place to guard the, Ar or the Ottoman Armenians' property. Uh, and, and at some point, they come back. We know that never happens. This is a bad plan, poorly executed. Um, but nevertheless, they start to move people. Where do they go to? The relocation destination is down here in the Euphrates Valley. Kind of in the desert. Our mythology is in the desert. In fact, it's in Deir el Zor in, in the Euphrates, right next to the Euphrates River. Um, maybe my guess is 350,000 are put in the pipeline coming here. Another significant portion flees across the border into the sanctuary of the Russian army. So a huge number wind up in the Caucasus. They will come back, as many of you know, and occupy in 1918, Erzurum, Kars, Erzincan, and form an Armenian Republic up here in 1918 in this particular area. We know 350,000 to 400,000 aren't moved at all. Now, who says that? Well, read Eris Serafian's book on Talat's Little Black Book. Eris Serafian in London at the Gemitis Institute talks about Talat's Little Black Book. When Talat is killed by Ar uh, Armenian assassins, a book of numbers is found in his wife's possession. And it outlines where the Armenians and the Kurds and the Bulgarians and the Jews and all the other minorities happened to be in 1917. Now this is not Ed Erickson or the Turks presenting this, it's Era Serafian and the Gmaitis Institute. But here's the point. A lot of people aren't moved. A lot of Ottoman Armenians continue up until the very end of the war in their own houses. If you look at this, nobody's living here. So the relocation is almost total for the provinces that are outlined in the Sultan's decree. The relocations themselves start in earnest in April. They end. They end in the fall of 1915, so it's only a six or seven month period. And at the end of this, that's what the demographics look like. Where do they get killed? In the movement down here. In the movement down here, convoys of Armenians are intercepted and massacred and brutalized women are raped and orphans are taken away to become Muslims and all kinds of bad things happen. 
There's no question. The record is crystal clear. Um, atrocities, heinous crimes are committed against these convoys of Armenians. They aren't guarded. Um, the Ottoman governors dropped the ball on the whole thing. Is it a crime of omission or is it a crime of commission? You'll have to decide for yourself. I can't really answer that because we don't know enough about it, to be honest. What we do know is that localized genocidal acts perpetrated by individuals happen frequently. We also know that the Ottoman government in 1916 put 1,600 perpetrators on trial and executes a fair number and imprisons the rest. So the Ottoman government reacts to this um, in a way that most people are, are generally unfamiliar with, even the ones that study the events. Context, relocation. When I was in high school, we read a, a poem called Evangeline, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The first line resonates with people my age. This is the forest primeval. It's a love story about a woman named Evangeline who is uprooted from her home in what's now the Canadian Maritime Provinces up near Halifax. It turns out it's not really, it's a love story, but it's also a story of counterinsurgency. It's a story where 12,000 people are ripped out of their homes. How come? Because they're in a guerrilla war insurgency against the British and exiled for life. Where do they wind up? Who the hell are the Cajuns? Do you suppose? How do Cajuns get to Louisiana? Cajuns are these people called the Acadians. So Evangeline is an Acadian French colonist who's taken from the maritime provinces with her family and goes to Louisiana. That's in 1755. The most well-known relocation of the age occurs during the Boer War. This is not a counterinsurgency. This is a counter guerrilla operation executed by the British against the Boers, the Dutch farmers in South Africa. They don't have enough soldiers to defeat the Boer guerrillas. What can they do? C.E. Caldwell writes about this in a famous book called Small Wars. He says you need to separate the guerrillas from their sources of supply. The British invent, not, not quite invent, but, but form what they call concentration camps and they move 100,000 civilians, women, kids, and old people into concentration camps. And oh, by the way, they kill their sheep and cattle and burn their homes. Problem, problem solved. It's ruthless. It's horrible. On humanitarian grounds, the people who invent this, Lord Roberts and Lord Kitchener, today would be war criminals. The uh, youngster in the lower right could, could be a starving Armenian. Did not. That's a starving boar child. The camps, like all of these camps, are infested with disease. There's very little medical support. The people are, are malnourished and they die in huge numbers. There's nothing out there in military history that presents this information. This is a great graduate or PhD thesis for somebody. Is relocation as a strategy. And here you see it. The Spanish invent the modern version on the island of Cuba. Butcher Weiler, he's nicknamed, separates insurgents from guerrillas. About half a million of them. We do it in the Philippines on the island of Samar. We separate, we put the inhabitants into enclaves, and then they go out and clean up the guerrillas. The Boer War we talked about, the Ottoman Empire, the Russians do it at the same time the Armenians are being relocated. Not, not Armenians, although they, they do move some of their own, but they, the Jewish population of what's now Belarus, Ukraine, um, and Eastern Poland. How come? Because the Jews of the Russian Empire are thought to be sympathetic to the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans. We moved famously the Nisi Japanese out of the state in 1942. How come? Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, George Marshall, the great George Marshall, our chief of staff, um, convinced Franklin D. Roosevelt that the Japanese of California are a threat. The Japanese are about to invade California and they will rise en masse, is what they call in those days a fifth column, and help the invaders. Is there any substantive evidence? No, there wasn't, there, there never was. It's, it's a pipe dream. 
It doesn't matter whether it was true. Franklin D. Roosevelt believed it might have been true. Everybody here is familiar with that. The, the largest one, the, the one of the most famous for us military historians, the Briggs Plan in Malaya, works like a charm. They knew about 500,000 people in what they call the, the new villages. And, and the vocabulary is interesting, I think. The British call them new villages. That sounds better than concentration camps. <laughs> we call them protected hamlets from Vietnam. The, the, the largest one of the bunch is the Quadrilage. It happens in Algeria. They, the French, between 1956 and 1959, moved 800,000 people, Algerian Muslims, into camps. And, and this works. They, they, cr they crush the insurgency. What's important about this? The Ottoman Turks are not alone. They're part of a moving train of relocation that's used as a strategy. It's different from that case. A concentration camp in South Africa in 1901 is not a concentration camp as it exists in Poland in 1944. These are not Auschwitz, Dachau, Birkenau, Sobibor. They're, they're camps of a different sort. So the vocabulary ten, tends to bleed over. When we use the word concentration camp, it tends to bleed over in our imagination as maybe something that it wasn't. Okay. I'm pretty much at the end here. I can't answer these questions. I'm not a cultural, genocide, uh, demographic, political, economic historian. I, I deal with military history. So these are the contentious issues. These are the questions that are argued about today everywhere when we talk about the events of 1915. There are six narratives that generate controversy. How many Armenians died? Some people use a word, use a figure, 1.5 million. There's a Turkish historian that says 56,000. Can you imagine 56,000? Are you kidding me? But but maybe those are extreme ends. I don't think it was 1.5 million. I think it's closer to 350,000 personally. I know it's it's a lot larger than 56,000. So, so these are questions that, that, are, that, that are guesswork at best right now. We don't know enough about them to actually answer them. To be frank, there is no authentic evidence that there was an intent to destroy the Armenians. The evidence is speculative. And, and if you don't believe that, go through the work of Raymond Kevorkian or Peter Balakian or Tanner Aksham or Vakan Dadrian and circle, circle the qualifiers. Circle the he probably thought. Surely, it seems that. It is likely that. You go through those books and start to circle those things and a pattern will emerge that is persuasive and compelling that suggests there, there's no real evidence. So I just throw that out there. What can I tell you that actually, actually I think I can prove? The book is exhaustively documented. Don't buy the book. It costs $70, an awful price. Go to the library, get it out on interlibrary loan and read it. It's exhaustively documented. The archival sources are, are balanced. I've got not just Turkish sources, Russian, French, British, and Armenian sources to tell this narrative. What can I tell you? The Armenian Revolutionary Committees were a threat. They had what soldiers called capability and capacity. They had weapons, they were trained, they were ready to use them, they were in the right position. And some did. Not all, only some. Not all the committees, some. And it works out, Van is the worst case, but they are a threat to Ottoman national security. Does it result in a large rebellion? No. But there's enough of a pattern to convince the decision makers that we need to change the policy and relocate people. This is beyond doubt today. Almost every scholar I know believes at least this. Yes, there were Armenian committees. Yes, they might have rebelled. And they're instigated and inflamed by the activities of the great powers. The Russians, the British, and the French are actively trying to recruit and get all of the subject peoples in the Ottoman Empire to revolt. That's a strategy. If you know not much about World War I, you may be familiar with the activities of a guy named Lawrence of Arabia. Thomas E. Lawrence, he's an archaeologist, not a soldier. 
But they put him on the Intel staff in Cairo, and he starts to talk about this stuff. And before you know it, they give Thomas E. Lawrence a bunch of gold and some machine guns, and they put him on the coast of Saudi Arabia. And he goes and he talks to the Sharif. And before you know it, we've got what we call the Arab Revolt. That's by design. That doesn't just happen. They're trying to get the Armenians to do that. They're trying to get the Jews in Gaza to do that. They don't call them Jews, they call them Zionists, because the Zionist colonies have started to populate what's now Israel. They're trying to get the Kurds to do this. They try to get the Marsh Arabs down in, in, in what's now modern day Iraq to do this. Most of the time it fails. It fails for the Armenians, not because they don't try, but because they're too far away from anything and the Ottomans have a solution. Thomas E. Lawrence gets things going pretty well. So that's, that's my thesis. That, that's what I think the book that I have proves. What would I hope you take away from this, whatever your position is on the six narratives? Keep in mind always that just a, a history book is not necessarily the truth. It it's, has a purpose, it has an agenda. What's mine? Mine is not to defend Turkey. Mine is not to justify or to rationalize a bad decision by a lot by Talat and and Jamal. My purpose is to explain the decision from a military point of view. Recognize that, that history is a narrative, it's not the truth. Recognize that there are portions and positions on both sides that, that use the same body of facts. And that there may be middle ground. Maybe it's not 1.5 million. Maybe it's not 56,000. Maybe it's something in between. Maybe it's not state-sponsored genocide. Maybe it's localized genocide by criminal individuals at, at the lower level. So, so there, there's some middle ground that we don't know about right now. It's 100 years ago. Serious work on this was not started, was not, was not begun by historians until the 1980s. So it's an immature historiography. It's not a hundred year history we're looking at. We're only looking at about 35 years of actual work by historians. So this is an immature history. It won't be complete until a lot more work is done on this. Um, if you're, if you're going to address this or approach this as an individual, read widely and read in depth. Don't just read the Armenians. Read the Turks. Read the British narrative and put it all together. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'm willing and happy to take questions. I'd like to keep the questions to the topic of 1915. I would rather we stay away from questions on contemporary Turkish politics. I'm not qualified to render those kind of things, uh, to be honest. Um, so if we could turn the lights on. Um, I'm hard of hearing. I'm a combat disabled veteran from three wars. My hearing shot. So. <laughs> When, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to everybody who has a question. Uh, please, if you could stand and speak loudly and clearly so not only I can hear, but the audience can hear as well. Uh, we'll start here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi. Um, my question is, uh, you know, the at least the government on the Turkish side wants and all the archives to be open and wants and maybe a bipartisan group to look at all the archives and you know start working on that history. How much were you hampered by you know not having the Russian or the Armenian archives? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, some of the mythology, the received wisdom is the Turkish archives are closed. They're open, they've been open since 1999. Um, whatever you think about Prime Minister, now President Erdogan, he has opened the archives. The AKP party is, is, is committed to transparency. Um, frankly, my, my limitations of language uh, limit, limit me. Um, what we don't have right now is, is a historian who's fluent in, in all the languages necessary to cross-level the archives. Some of us can read Turkish, some of us can read Armenian. There are a couple who read both of those. But those people don't read Russian. And the Russians are an important part of this. The Russians are the ones who instigate and inflame the committees like, like nobody's business. So what's the answer to the question? Uh, the Turkish archives are open. The Armenian archives are closed. I won't go into the reasons for that. 
The Armenian Committee archives in Massachusetts are closed. I won't comment on that. Uh, British archives are open, so are the French, and so are the Russian archives today, although they are getting more tight. The Putin administration is tightening up on that. Um, so it's, 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 it's a hard thing. We, we're not going to make a breakthrough. How will progress be made by historians? It won't be a dramatic breakthrough. Ah, uh, some, some, some brilliant um, thesis by, by, by a historian. It's going to be baby steps. It's pieces. It's, it's a piece here and a piece there. And it's going to take 50 years to put this thing together.